podbean.com. A technology geek podcast has been ever since like Apple Lions. Today is Sunday, May 14th, 2023, and this is show number 940. Well, 18 years ago yesterday, I picked up a microphone and I recorded the very first episode of the Nocella cast. I'm very proud of the work I've done here, but you know what? I don't take full credit for keeping the show going with fresh episodes every single week. I absolutely could not do this without the support of Steve. He does nearly every chore around the house, which leaves me free to write the shows, record the shows, be on other people's shows, basically keeps the podcast going. And of course, where would the shows be without Bart Bouchotts? From security bits to taming the terminal to programming by stealth, he provides not just content, but he's a wonderful human being that I I really feel honored to get to hang out with every couple of weeks. We have so much fun together. Without Bart and Alistair taking the reins while I'm gallivanting around the world, the streak would not have continued either. And I couldn't do it without all of the Nocilla castaways who provide reviews for the show that lower my workload when things get tight, you know, like when I want to go play with the grandkids. Oh, I'm not sure I would have kept going all this time if it wasn't for the live show listeners. They make it ever so much more fun to create the shows. They're giving me a hard time right now, sending p- pictures of uh, sausage because we call it get, watching the sausage get made. But, you know, I know they'd throttle me if I missed a week, so I know that they're important to keeping this show going. And if you're listening, thank you so much for staying subscribed. All right, enough pats on the back. Let's get into the show. Well, this week, Steve and I both joined Bodie Grimm on his awesome Kilowatt podcast. We got into a fascinating discussion on the use of deep fakes as a legal defense strategy, including their application by Tesla's legal team. Check out Kilowatt in your podcatcher of choice, because it's a great podcast about EV news done by one of the most self-deprecating and hilarious people I've ever met in my life. We both love Bodie, and we had a blast with him, so follow the link in the show notes, but uh, you can just look for Kilowatt Podcast in your podcatcher of choice. When Bart and I recorded Programming by Stealth 150, all about bash script terminal plumbing, neither of us was actually happy with what we did. I got very confused in the middle, and I mean way more confused than usual, and Bart decided that his original strategy might have been flawed, in which he assumed everyone had heard the Taming the Terminal podcast and remembered everything he taught more than four years ago. So he went back and he completely rewrote the show notes for PBS 150, and we re-recorded the entire episode. I got to tell you, it was ever so much more fun, and I really understood what he was teaching this time through. Not because I'd heard it twice, but because the show notes are that much better, and the explanations were very sequential, and he gave us the first principles. Like, when he does that, those are the ones that really work well. Now, he also realized after we recorded the first time that there was a bit of information he hadn't taught us, which was crucial to being able to complete the challenge that he had set for us. If you understood PBS 150 the first time through, and you want to jump right to the new part in the new recording, I put a chapter mark in the audio file that will take you right to where he explains slash dev slash TTY. We're really proud to have done this a second time because we're both of the same mind that we need to stay committed to the quality of what we're creating here, both for the current listeners and for the future listeners. So if you look in your podcatcher of choice for Chit Chat Across the Pond 767 or Programming by Stealth 150, you will find that the entire episode exists a second time, and it's called Take Two This Time Through. Uh, with any luck, if you fl- if you delete the first one, it'll never come back. But if you want to keep it, I don't know, like as a collector's item or something like that, you certainly could. If you're a happy Twitter user, I have no intention of trying to make you sad about that. At the same time, I'd like to tell you why Mastodon is so much more fun for me. I'm sure this is going to shock you, but I'm someone who loves conversation. I know there's a lot of people who just like to lurk and enjoy the contributions of others, but I simply have to contribute to the conversation, and I want other people to react in some way to the things I post. A Mastodon sounds mysterious, but it absolutely is not. I use it exactly the way I use Twitter, but I'm getting so much more out of it. Let me explain by example. On Twitter, I have 3,673 followers. Let's call that roughly 4,000. Now, that's not Taylor Swift kind of numbers, but that's a whole lot of people who could potentially read and enjoy the drivel I post online. On Mastodon, I have only 680 followers, which is less than 20% the number of Twitter followers I have. To put that another way, my reach should be five times more on Twitter than on Mastodon. 
Well, a couple of weeks ago, I wrote an article about the app PopFrame that allows you to add bezel frames to iPhone screenshots. You probably remember it. I sent the exact same post out on both Twitter and Mastodon. Here's what I wrote. I think iPhone screenshots look silly without the frame around them, but it's too hard to add it. Until PopFrame. And then I put the title of the post, make your iPhone screenshots stand out with PopFrame, and a link to the post. Both services expanded the blog URL nicely to show my pretty featured image. The only difference between the two posts was that on Twitter, I tagged the developer Ramik and his PopFrame account. Ramik doesn't appear to have a presence yet on Mastodon. I watched the post for seven days on both services to track engagement, and the results are in. On Twitter, the post received zero comments. None. Nada. Nothing. On Mastodon, the same post about PopFrame received seven comments. Now let's look at likes and reposts. On Mastodon, my post about PopFrame got 17 reposts and 23 likes. That's great. But on Twitter, it only got two of each. And one of the accounts that liked and reposted it was the PopFrame account itself. So other than the developer, only one person retweeted it. So think about that. This article got one-eighth as many reposts on an account with five times as many followers. That's a factor of 40 on engagement per follower on Mastodon versus Twitter. In just two hours, a photo of my cat got seven times as many likes on Mastodon as my article about PopFrame did on Twitter in a whole week. Now, sure, of course, my cat is lovely, but it wasn't even Catter Day. It was on a Tuesday. In 12 hours, it had 14 likes. Now, I've been trying to figure out why I'm getting so much more traction on Mastodon than I've ever gotten on Twitter, and I have a few ideas. The first thing I was thinking about was that now that I can't use a third-party Twitter client myself, and I have to use the official Twitter app or log into the website, I have a lot of trouble finding the content from the people I follow. Perhaps the algorithm simply doesn't surface my content to my nearly 4,000 followers on Twitter. Now, the second thing is, it's very possible that the vast majority of my followers on Twitter are actually just bots. Maybe they aren't real people. Or maybe the followers I have on Twitter aren't really there anymore because they perceive it as being more toxic. Like I said up front, if you're still enjoying Twitter or you want less engagement with your followers, good on you. But if you're looking for folks a lot more excited to engage with each other and with way less rage, I highly suggest you check out Mastodon. There are tons of beginner how-tos out there now, like the one from Mozilla that I linked to in the show notes, and they've made picking a server way easier now. When That was one of the big hang-ups a lot of people had. You basically, when you go to sign up, you get two choices. They say, here's one of the main ones, or choose one of your own. So if you just pick the main one you're offered, you can go in and start having fun. Start uh, Look for me, look for the people I follow, and start poking follow, follow, follow on those, and you'll start to find people who are really, really interesting. And I just, I don't know, I find it great. I'm getting so much more fun out of Mastodon today than I do from Twitter. Every once in a while, you come across a tech product that has zero value, but it just makes you smile. This week, I paid $4 for a macOS menu bar app called Clack. It's spelled K-L-A-C-K. Clack's entire job is to make your normal keyboard sound like a mechanical keyboard. It simulates mechanical switches, and it's awesome. You can customize which switch you'd like to simulate, choosing between the Everglides Crystal Purple or Oreo switches or Cream from Novel Keys. You can change the volume of the keys between soft, balanced, and loud. That's literally it. I don't know why, but this makes me really happy. I used Audio Hijack to capture the sounds of the keyboard as I typed out the classic typing class phrase, now is the time for all good women to come to the aid of their country. Let's listen to all three of them. This is the crystal purple switches. Well, that's pretty fun, but it has a little too much complexity to it for my taste. There's a lot happening with each keystroke. You can move to hear the switches moving around. This is the Oreo switches. Well, I'm kind of liking that a little bit better, or it was a, a lot less complex sound, but the fact that the space bar makes a different sound really kind of distracts my brain. Let's listen to the final one. 
This is the cream switches. So I really like the high clear clicks of that Oreo keyboard switches, and the spacebar isn't very different in sound from any of the other keys. The good news, though, is that each of us can choose the keyboard we like best. I'm going to stick with Oreo, but you can try the other ones if you like. Now, if you really like clack, but sometimes it's not appropriate to make so much noise, you can toggle clack off with a keyboard shortcut to find in settings. I've started to use that a lot because, you know, doing a podcast, maybe it's not the best idea to have it going in the background. Now, by default, the shortcut is set to Option Command K, but you can change it to something else if you like. Now, the developer says at triclack.com that clack has a high fidelity sound and even immersive spatial audio. I don't know about immersive spatial audio, but sure. Now, I hadn't noticed this until I read it on the website, but the keys actually make a different sound going down as they do going up. How fun is that? By the way, Clack is a native app created in Swift. Clack seems like something people with visual impairments might like because, well, it turns out they like everything everyone else likes, right? I ran Clack through my usual tests, and I was able to interact with the menu bar app without any difficulties, changing the volume and keyboard options. However, settings for Clack wouldn't let me navigate to the different options. I dropped a note to the developer, and I expect they'll get it sorted. There's not that much in settings anyway, so you can definitely use Clack until it's sorted. I know making your quiet keyboard artificially make noise is a silly thing to enjoy, but I really am enjoying it. If you've priced out mechanical keyboards, $4 might sound like a very reasonable price to get you at least a small part of the joy of a mechanical keyboard, even if you can't feel it. Now, to pr prove that I'm not the only one who thinks this is fun, this is what Bill Reveal wrote in our Slack shortly after I posted about Clack. You are so evil. Just spent my money to get it, and I'm sitting here just loving the idiocy of hearing my MacBook clickety-clack away. It will drive me crazy every so often, but it also lets me know I've actually typed something, which is a good thing. Even this post is making me giggle with the sounds of a mechanical keyboard. I swear, my keyboard even feels better. So, proof, Bill Reveal gives it his sign of approval. You can buy Clack in the Mac App Store or at tryclack.com. A little more than a year ago, I told you about Shower Power from Ampere, which is a hydro-powered Bluetooth shower speaker. We bought Shower Power through Kickstarter in October of 2020, and as often happens with crowdfunded efforts, it took forever to get the device, you know, where forever is defined as about a year and a half. I guess we should count ourselves lucky that we got it at all because not everybody gets what they thought they were going to get when they do these crowdfunded uh, operations. So shower power is a device that you put between the shower head and the pipe to which the shower head normally connects. So it kind of makes your shower head lower. You then connect the Bluetooth speaker to the side of the shower power. The device has an impeller that generates energy from the power of the water coming through to charge the Bluetooth speaker. When we bought shower power, we bought an extra droplet, which is what they call their Bluetooth speakers. At first, we thought the whole system was pretty cool, but over time, we've kind of become disenchanted. The device leaked, so Steve had to turn it to kind of an illogical angle that made it a little harder to hear the speaker and get to the controls, and the device did cause our shower head to be lower than we actually wanted it to be. Since Bluetooth on a speaker is pretty much a nightmare to be used by two different phones, I always use the second droplet but just by setting it inside the shower, and Steve used the one that was on the impeller that was actually on the, the shower power. The other thing is that Bluetooth speakers last a long time on battery, so it turned out that having a, a speaker stay charged from hydroelectric power wasn't actually that big of, a, of an advantage. Steve ended up getting rid of the shower power itself, and then we just used our droplets as independent devices, charging them from the mains. But the audio quality on the droplets isn't quite what we hoped for either. In my original review, I wrote, quote, Deep voices in spoken podcasts are a bit muddled for our taste, but I didn't expect super high fidelity. Now, most tech podcasts are created by men, or at least the ones I've chosen to listen to are predominantly male voices, and it's often hard to understand what they're saying with the droplet unless I crank the volume way up. My birthday rolled around this year, as it seems to do every year so far, and my mother and father-in-law sent me an Amazon gift card. I love these gift cards because I save them for something I do not need, but I just really want. I wanted a new waterproof Bluetooth speaker appropriate for the shower. 
I found a terrific site called rtings.com, so R-T-I-N-G-S.com. And this is a place where they review a lot of different things. They've got home entertainment, uh, home products like vacuums and blenders. They've got computer peripherals they, they cover, and electronics such as headphones, speakers, and cameras. Now, the categories for the review are not as broad as, say, the wire cutter, but they go deep and deep in all the good ways. So they have a page dedicated to the six best shower speakers of spring 2023. They categorize the winners as best, best mid-range, best lower mid-range, budget, cheap, and smart. They also provide a summary table of 58 of the 113 speakers they tested. That's a lot of speakers. Now, the reason I trusted the recommendation is that they test and score by a lot of different qualities. Specifically, they rate speakers for uh, music, videos and movies, outdoor sound, and most importantly, podcasts. So they get a rating on all those different uh, types of things you might want to listen to. You can sort their summary table by how well these devices did by these categories. Now, I'm definitely not going to dig into the details of the six speakers they recommended, but I do want to talk about the one I chose and what I learned from the Artings review. I want I ended up going with the best low let me get this right. Best lower mid-range because it was close to my budget at $80. Now, that was on Amazon and it's normally $100, so it was 80 bucks. The best lower mid-range speaker is the Ultimate Ears Wonder Boom 3. Now, I yelled it like that because it's in all capital letters, Wonder Boom. <laughs> anyway, I not only like the price point, but it also comes in hyper pink, which has value to me, great value, because it's a Steve repellent, keeps him from stealing mine. But the main thing that caught my eye was that it got a 7.9 out of 10 on listening to podcasts. Now, that makes it tied for third place of the 58 speakers they reviewed. The only two that rated higher for podcasts were the $400 Sonos Move, and the other one was the previous generation of the Ultimate Ears, which was the Wonder Boom 2. Now, they were rated, uh, those two speakers were rated 8.1 and 8.0, so 7.9 is great for the $80 price of Wonder Boom 3. The Wonder Boom 3 is rated IP67, which according to the specs means completely protected from dust and protection from immersion in water for up to uh, one meter for up to 30 minutes. It floats in water, so this could be super fun in a pool, and it's supposed to have over 22 hours of playtime. I wish it had USB charging, but sadly, behind a waterproof, a water-sealed access door, it's still sporting the most annoying connector ever designed, micro USB. Now, the full review page on Artings has even more information and scoring, and, and it, it just gets super nerdy. You can see the raw frequency response curve for the device and the frequency response accuracy. I don't even know what that second one is, but the Wonder Boom 3 gets a slope of 0.76 and standard error of 2.71 dB, low frequency extension of 88.5 hertz, and high frequency extension of 16.0 kilohertz. So that's got to be good, right? I don't know what any of that means. Anyway, you can see the sound stage and dynamics too, if you know what those are. Well, technically, you probably see them even if you don't know what those are, but you know what I mean. Artings have also detailed sections explaining the scores for style, portability, build quality, and controls. I would agree with their assessment on the Wonder Boom 3 as a 9.3 on portability. It looks kind of like a shorter version of a big girl HomePod and has a nice fabric look uh, hook on it to hang on a shower caddy. They gave the Wonder Boom 3 a 9.0 on build quality, which is also great. I'd even agree with their 6.6 .6 rating on the controls on Wonder Boom 3. There are three buttons on the top and I haven't been able to reliably remember to figure out each, what each one of these buttons do. I know the big center button is a play pause button, and I read in the manual that double pushing it will skip forward, which is nice for skipping commercials. But the other two are more mysterious. I don't understand why they did them this way. One is a small bump with a hole for a light to shine through, and the other one is an indented button with a slot for a light to shine through there. And I think the slotted indent is to turn it on and off, and I think the bump is to pair it, but I've also gotten it into pairing mode accidentally using the indent button. I swear I did it one time. On the side of the Wonder Boom 3, there are giant plus minus buttons, which even I can figure out, are to turn the volume up and down. They're harder to push than I would like, but at least I can figure them out. On the bottom of the Wonder Boom 3, there's a button with an evergreen tree on it, and you use this button to turn on an outdoor mode. 
They say it's specifically tuned for the great outdoors. I tested this mode, outdoors of course, and at higher volumes, my podcast got louder and more clear. When I did it at lower volumes, I couldn't actually tell the difference with and without the evergreen tree button pressed, but I am looking forward to knowing my neighbors with outdoor mode. Now, if you've got visual impairments, all of these buttons are very touchable. You can tell where they are, you can feel the difference between them, so that's a big advantage, I think. Even if I can't figure out which one's which, you probably can. Now, Wonder Boom 3 makes a lot of different noises to let you know what it's doing. Let me turn it on for you here and see if you can hear it. I'm going to, wait, that's the wrong button. I pressed the wrong button right away. Let's see. Okay, that was turning it on. If I turn it off, I think that was turning it off. Yeah, that was turning it off. It had extra sounds. And then it's got a different uh, set of noises for pairing. And uh, it will turn itself off if you forget about it for a while, and you'll actually hear it turn itself off. Now, I was originally going to say that the Wonder Boom 3 doesn't have a battery charge indicator because there's no set of lights to look at. But again, in something that's better for people with visual impairment or helps people with visual impairments, there is a way to do it. In a desperate move, I finally read the tiny paper fold manual, and it said to hold down the plus, the plus minus buttons at the same time. I did that, and here's the sound that it made. Okay, that's nice, but what does that noise mean? Is that full? Is that empty? Is it somewhere in between? I don't know. So in an even more desperate move, I did some of the Googles and I found an Ultimate Ears webpage with some FAQs, one of which expanded to explain the three sounds. The sound we heard meant that the battery was half full. If the battery is fully charged, it sounds like this. And if it's running low, it makes a sound that I think we're all used to hearing. Yeah, we're all used to that sad sound. So the one that kind of goes up with a loop at the end, that's the one when it's full. And the one that's just kind of mediocre kind of sound doesn't seem to convey any information. That's the medium one. So it is actually really good at telling you what these different levels are. And don't use lights, which drive people who have visual impairments crazy because they can't see the lights. But hopefully you can hear the sounds. If you're uh, audio impaired, I think you're going to be out of luck. You're actually not going to know. But uh, this uh, has 22-hour battery life, which is pretty good. So, you know, plug it in every couple of weeks, probably you'll be fine. Probably the most extraordinary feature of the Wonder Boom 3 is one that was promised in the R-Tings testing. But I did not believe it before I bought it. This speaker will pair to two devices at the same time. I am not kidding. Two and it actually works. I paired it to my iPhone first, then my iPad, and I was able to play on one, stop, then play on the other, all without going into Bluetooth settings to connect. I'm not joking, it actually worked. It was miraculous. I remember when we had our Acuras and switching devices was so hard with Bluetooth and so time consuming and failed a lot that we instituted a rule that the owner of the car got to use Bluetooth, but the other person had to use a wired connection in that car and the opposite in the other car. It was the only way to achieve peace in our family. Now, Steve paired his iPhone with my new speaker, and that pretty much destroyed everything, proving that the miracle does not extend to more than two devices. As soon as I disconnected the iPad, then we were able to toggle back and forth between the two phones with ease. He thought that's how I was going to keep things so he could use my new speaker too. He was wrong. I sent him a link to buy a boring black Wonder Boom 3 for himself, and he said, oh good, because that pink is awful. Mission accomplished. So after all this yapping, I realized I haven't talked about the sound itself of the speakers. I can say that podcasts are much easier to understand now with Wonder Boom 3. My main test is the Accidental Tech Podcast, where really often I could not understand John Syracuse when using the shower power droplet. We do have trouble hearing John when we play ATP on the car on road trips, too. So maybe some of the mix has just got him in a muddled state. But with Wonder Boom 3, his voice came through really clearly. It was slightly harder to hear Casey Liss, who has a higher pitched voice in the cast. But I just boosted the volume a little more and I was able to hear them both with ease. Steve is very happy with the audio quality on his as well. Really happy that he was able to get one. And by the way, he ordered it this morning and I'm holding it in my hand and showing it to the live audience right now. Uh, Amazon delivered it to him same day.
The Ultimate Ears Wonder Boom 3 meets all of my needs, including repelling Steve with Hyper Pink and especially delivering my podcast for ear easy and clear listening. Being able to pair to two devices at once is a dream I did not know would be realized in my lifetime. You can learn more about Wonder Boom 3 on the Ultimate Ears website, but if you go there and you buy direct, you'll actually pay more. I highly encourage you to check out the detailed reviews of shower speakers on rtings.com and use their affiliate links because we want these people to keep doing this kind of testing. And you can go in there and play around in all of the other categories they review and test. Again, that's rtings.com. Well, it's time for pledge break, but instead of asking for money this week, I'd like to thank all those who support the show financially for making it easier for me to do the show. Keeping going for 18 years, I'm telling you, it really makes a difference to know that you get enough value out of the show to actually plunk down your hard-earned money to support the work we do here. You have made 18 years of podcasting possible. Well, it's that time of the week again. It's time for Security Bits with Bart Bouchotts, but I am telling you, we cannot catch a break like, nothing's going wrong right now. This is horrible. It's an interesting way to look at the universe. Um, <laughs> content creators have the strangest problems. <laughs> well, I love security bits. I love uh, chatting with you about the latest disasters and what we can do about it. But uh, this might be the shortest one possible unless I can stretch it out by asking uh, dumb questions. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see oh. how that works out. Bart only did a small cup of coffee today, so... Yeah, I don't have full reign. Well, you say that you, there may be more here than it looks like. There may be more here than it looks like. But anyway, we have some follow-ups. Okay, so I don't think we were off the call for like more than a few hours when everyone's phone and, and computer started to get a notification about the first rapid security response. We had been musing about yeah. the fact that they, they had put out 16.4.1 and not as a rapid security response. And then, hey, presto, our first rapid security response. And I don't know about you, but the reboot was real quick. Yeah, yeah. I see that you've got a link to the article by uh, Adam Angst and mm. Tidbits, and he actually timed it. And I can't believe he did this. It, that shows you his dedication to the sport is he did it on four devices. And just imagine running a timer watching a scroll bar of indeterminate length, right? Oh, just. Geez. Just staring attention. at it, knowing this could be an hour, this could be 10 minutes, I don't know. But they were, I think the longest one was something like 13 minutes from door to door doing it. Hmm, I don't think any of mine were that long. I guess I have faster machines or something. I, I was pleasantly surprised. So Yeah, yeah anyway. most of them, was, his were shorter, you know, four minutes, those kind of numbers, I think. But uh, I, I, I just really applauded his dedication to sit there timing it, you know. I'm not I think one of them might have been an older iMac. Yeah. I'd, I'd yeah. Oh, yeah, that's what I do. Yeah, yeah I start the timer and then a half hour later look back and go, oh, well, because you don't, especially because you didn't know how long it would be. Yeah. Right? And then I end up writing sort of like, definitely less than an hour. Could have been two minutes. Could have been, could have been 58 minutes, but definitely less than an hour. Yeah. Um, now, one of the cool things that he uh, described exactly how to do is you can actually remove the rapid security response update. And he did it. He went through the process of doing it on uh, two different kinds of devices so that he could prove it could be done because these are little little uh, barnacles on the operating system that you can tear off and put back on. Well, yeah, because he actually, it's, I'm almost certain it was his article. One of the articles I read explained very nicely because something I think people haven't realized because Apple have done it so cleverly is that the the important parts of your operating system are actually what's called immutable. They are read-only, which is a fantastic protection from malware, because if the malware can't change the, can't change the operating system, it's very hard to infect things. And how do you do a quick update to something that is immutable? So the reason a normal <laughs> software update takes a long time is because you're actually getting a full image down you're temporarily thawing out the OS, replacing the old image with the new image, and then refreezing it to make it immutable again, which is why it takes so long. But these are actually little disk images that sort of get mounted on the side. And because Apple invented the overlay file system, so since I think two OSs back, maybe three, if you go in and you ex expand all of the views in disk utility, make it hide nothing from you, make it show you everything, you will see that Macintosh HD is two. 
Right. And that's because Apple developed a technology that allows you to overlay two file systems and they present as one file system, but half of it is read-only and half of it is normal. And they sort of, I always think of it like, you know the old transparencies and the overhead projectors? It's like they have two transparencies for your hard disk. One of them is that you can write on, is the one where you know, your home directory is and everything. And the other one is the system one and it is immutable. And they literally put them on top of each other and you see one file system with one folder structure. And these little software updates are like a third layer on the transparencies. It's just a little small little disk image that gets merged in with the other ones. Are, so are you saying you actually can see it if you go into disk utility, you can see the, the third one or no? I, I don't know if you can see the third one, but in terms of how it actually works under the hood is what I'm saying is that there, it gets layered into the, transpar- into the overlay file system. Okay, right, right, right. Yeah, I remember that being really disturbing when there became uh, Macintosh HD data and Macintosh HD volumes. And uh, I do notice that it's they have changed the naming convention from when they first did it. They have. It says Macintosh HD snapshot. And it's a snapshot of the real operating system. So it isn't even the real one. Oh, snapshots are a whole different thing. A, no, there if are you so read, many weeds here If you read to Adam's to. article... Yes. Well, but in, if you read his article, he talks about the fact that it is a snapshot. You want to read the way Adam describes it. But I was I was really surprised at that. And they actually do denote it as that. So it, it's funny. It says Apple SSD. Inside that, I've got a container disk three. Inside of that, I've got Macintosh HD volumes. Inside of that, I've got Macintosh HD, which is grayed out. And below that, this is now four levels deep from the top, Macintosh HD snapshot. And then up one level is Macintosh HD data. So they really have done some interesting chicanery here to make it uh, more secure. Yeah, and it looks like, as far as you're concerned in the Finder, it's just, just you just have a hard disk. But there's so much going on here. And the snapshotting, which is a copy on write concept, is also genius. And the overlay file system is genius. And the immutable, like this is really high end computer science. This, like the Mac isn't just secure by obscurity anymore. The Mac is secure by design, by really good design. Like it's yeah yeah not not invulnerable hence rapid security response update one sixteen dot four dot one a and thirteen dot three dot one a right precisely precisely but it, it is very impressive computer science um come a long way from the days when I, I was I th- taught operating systems yeah I think it's also important to note uh, one of the reasons these uh, updates are so quick is they're small. So mm. people uh, like uh, Bob Goodrich, who's pretty active in our Slack community and a listener to the show and very security conscious, he when there's a big software update, he has to take his uh, iMac and put it in his car and drive it an hour and a half to an Apple store because he doesn't have the bandwidth out in the woods where he lives. Whoa. So this is... Uh, this, th- I think these kind of updates will be a, a, a happy joy joy for, for uh, Bob. Or people who are traveling and who are having to, to make use of mobile data and oh, stuff. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just a yeah, good idea. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, just make them small, yeah. make, make them what they need to be and no more. So yeah, that's the first follow-up. Um, then we had a conversation about how attackers were turning their mind to the Mac last time. And then you and I continued that conversation on Let's Talk Apple. And I can't remember what we said where. Uh, but I do know that uh, the third, I think we did two stories here last time, and that was the third one, which we got all three in Let's Talk Apple, but one of them, the listeners here haven't heard. So okay. just to prove that this is a trend that is continuing, there is now another, now it is again a Trojan, so I'll, I'll preempt your question, yeah, because I know you're going to ask me, how do we catch this? Yeah, it's still a Trojan. In this case, a... So you have to, you have to go get it. You have to go get it or be tricked into getting okay. it. Correct. Um... Uh, it's pretending to be a PDF viewer. Uh, the malware has been named Rust Bucket by, um, s- no, Intego. Um, we know that it is by a group of attackers called Blue Noroff, who are a part of the Lazarus group, who we are as certain as one can be that they are the North Korean government. And they are targeting oh. actively the Mac. So, again, we are on an OS that is really well designed, that is very well looked after, that is, you know, that does security well but it's never perfect. And the L- So what if you're, if you are tricked to downloading uh, this PDF viewer, mm-hmm. this supposed PDF viewer, what happens to you? Well, you need to be tricked into more than downloading it. You need to be tricked into installing it and then clicking OK to all of the various pop-ups granting it access to things. Right. But With if you spyware. think it's a real PDF viewer, you might do that. Then it does... Uh, basically, they can do whatever they want. Is it code execution? They can do whatever they want. 
So they, that gets them in the door and it will then phone home and say, so what do you need me to do? So it might be steal all of your crypto if they're in a money making mood. It might be spy on you if they're in, if you're a diplomat or something. I mean, okay, th- this is a tool that it's a mechanism. Correct. Okay. I, yeah, it's, it's, it's the mechanism to get in. And once they're in, they're going to do whatever it is they are motivated to do to you. And at that time. We are, what's the problem to be solved? It's basically, they need access. Mm-hmm. They need to get in. And this this, this is the front door. This gets them in. And then bad things okay. happen. Uh, we also talked last time about the fact that uh, things were not looking good for MSI. And at that stage, we were still thinking in terms of... Uh, div- who's MSI again? They are a company that make motherboards. Okay. For big companies, you may have heard of like HP and IBM and those kind of... So a home user would be building their own PC, might buy an MSI motherboard is why we would care? Ex- extremely likely to buy an MSI motherboard and someone who buys a PC is quite likely to have one anyway. They're, they're a oh, major Oh, okay. Vendor. Not, so not, not home builders just inherently already having it. Okay. Yeah, MSI right. are just a big player in this space. They make good stuff. Unfortunately, they appear to have had a catastrophic security failure. The, right, the bottom line stays the same. So the bottom line we came to last time was only install firmware that you yourself download from MSI's website. And that is that remains the bottom line for home users. For corporate IT, I think the bottom line is you take all of those PCs and you throw them in the bin. Because Why? So your motherboard, to protect it from malicious firmware has literally burned into it. It's called a fusing system. It's a write once and it happens with a hardware few. The act of writing it breaks the circuitry. It can never be rewritten. So the public key is burned into your motherboard. And that private key is used to sign valid firmware. That is the private key they have lost. There is no way to update your motherboard. But we just said that for home users, you just make sure you get the the correct um, the correct firmware correct. updates from the from the vendor. Why isn't that true for corporations? It is true for corporations, but for corporations, if you are traveling about and you have corporate information of value on your laptop and you're you're traveling around, that's not enough. Like if I'm the CEO of a company, that's not enough. Someone could physically grab my machine in the hotel room or whatever. And download the, the other firmware. Put any other firmware in it, and the, the machine will accept it as valid and boot. So not only root kits, but, but boot kits. So if you were signing the checks for the throw it in the bin strategy, would you say uh, all laptops or would you say all the desktops too? I would have to do a risk assessment. And what I would probably end up doing is saying that anyone who works in finance or a few cert- or, or maybe on research that's particularly sensitive can't have these. Our machine, you know, our public access machines for the students or whatever. Well, yeah, that's fine. Um, you know, machines that are doing, <laughs> you know, customer support, fine. I, I think you'd, you'd probably want to triage okay. it because you don't want the bill to be too huge. But for if you're a journalist, if you're a lawyer, if you, you know, if you're basically if you're someone who knows that you're supposed to be careful, you just can't use one of these motherboards. Wow. You can't be careful. And, and that is a huge company, right? I mean... Yes. A lot of com- a lot of companies use um, MSI motherboards. Yeah. Hey, maybe the PC market will pick up because of this. They've been they've <laughs> been slog- they've been stuff, uh, yeah. lagging. <laughs> yeah, it's not a particularly good way to make people upgrade and feel happy about it, right? Not exactly. P- probably want other strategies. Yeah, pretty much. And this is actually a really good segue into our first real story. So it has been Patch Tuesday, and Microsoft have released patches which include a whole bunch of zero days. And one of those zero days is in the other side of that same firmware functionality we were talking about. So your motherboard has all of these keys baked in and stuff, and the operating system can leverage the security from those public keys to boot itself in such a way that it can't be tempered with. There was actually a bug in Windows, and Microsoft have had to change out some keys and stuff. And so basically, if you're in corporate IT, you need to apply the latest Windows updates and you have a manual process to perform on every laptop that you need to have Secure Boot working on. Oh, jeez. So again, you're triaging That's... the same triage process I just described. You're doing the same thing again, and you're going to triage. So Microsoft are promising an automated update within a few months. 
But for now, if you need to get Secure Boot re-enabled immediately, you have to visit each machine and manually do it. So again, you're going to triage it. You're going to start in the finance department, CEO's office, and you're going to wow. apply your resources as appropriate. But again, for us home users, I don't think there's any reason to go and stress out about it because Secure Boot may not this even be enabled. So what exactly is Secure Boot? Secure Boot cryptographically, your iPhone does Secure Boot. That's why you can't run an OS on your iPhone that isn't from Apple. So it's cryptographically okay. signed from the hardware all the way up to the point of the operating system boot. So you can't run non-Apple OSs. The same is possible on a PC. But the Macs don't have, the Macs don't have that though? They do if they have an M series processor. If they basically, if they have... So wouldn't the T2 chip? The T2 have or no? Basically, you need to have a T1, a T. Basically, you need to have a T chip or an M chip. So you can have an Intel machine okay. with the T chip doing that work, or you can have an M chip, okay. which has the function. The T chip is basically an, an iPhone chip sitting next to the Intel chip, pretend <laughs> you know, helping it do its thing. And the M okay. chip just has that functionality baked right the way in because hey, it's Apple Silicon all the way down. So if you have a Mac with a T chip or an M chip, you have Secure Boot on your Mac as an option that you can disable in your. It's not called a BIOS; it's UEFI, but you can disable it. So you can actually run Linux on your Mac. On your iPhone, you can't disable it. PCs, right. if okay. they have a high-end enough motherboard can have the same kind of cryptographic assurance that your operating system has not been tampered with. It's called Secure Boot. It's something that you would need to turn on. I don't think typical home computers would come with it turned on uh, hmm. because it means you can't install Linux, right? If you have Secure Boot on, you can't install Linux. So I don't think it's on all the time. But in corporate IT... Even with the, even with the what is it, Linux subsystem for Windows? Well, that's not installing Linux. That's part of Windows. Oh, okay. You're booting Windows, well, so they can have yeah. So they can have Linux if they want to. They don't even with Secure Boot. True. Uh, but that's you, kind of the best of both worlds. Well, but you're still booting Windows, right? So if you think yeah. Windows is a yeah, big pile no, of bloatware that's eating up way more of your RAM than it needs to, you're doing that and running a Linux on it. So that's not really efficient. Well, I suppose. Yeah, but no. So again, us home users. Probably not all that relevant, but corporate IT are not having a but good I appreciate week of it. You I appreciate you doing the translation into terminology. I can understand them between Windows and, and uh, Apple. Oh. Uh, okay, where was I? Okay, scrolly, scrolly. Uh, notable news then. So AI is kind of a thing that we haven't talked a huge amount about because it's sort of background I bet noise. to the relief of everybody because it's <laughs> talked about on every single show. <laughs> it is, but I do think it's worth pointing out that one of, he's described as the godfather of AI. Now, this is a guy who's been researching neural networks since the 1970s. So he has earned some and jobs his name here. is? Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Hinton. He's mm -hmm. one of the, he won the Turing Award, which is considered to be the Nobel Prize of computer science, because obviously when Alfred Nobel was around, there were no computers. They were humans. They were not um, devices yet. So there is no actual Nobel Prize. But he's a pretty big deal on the technologies that we now take for granted. And he's been with Google for some time since Google bought his company. And he stayed very quiet in the last couple of weeks when the various open letters were doing the rounds and stuff, because he's one of these people who, I, old fashioned in the nicest possible way, he was like, well, I'm not criticizing my employer. So he gave Google his notice, worked out his notice, didn't say a word, had apparently a nice conversation with Sundar Pichai on the way out. And now he has left Google. So now he's saying, and I am now dedicating the rest of my life to campaigning for the proper management of AI to protect us all. He he is also still complimentary of Google that they're going slowly. He is. He's just afraid that... Which is interesting. Unless there's an outside regulator to apply the brakes, the inevitable forces of competition, which is usually in our favor, right? We love the <laughs> fact that Samsung compete with Apple because it makes both of them be better. But if you're afraid that AI is running ahead of our ability to control AI, then at the moment you're panicking because you have ChatGPT, you have Bard. These are like there's real competition here at the moment. And so this is now the time to start raising your voice if you believe it's time to be careful. So it was very interesting to me to watch uh, Jeffrey Hinton because he um, I, I heard about it first on DTNS because they cover the tech news and mm. then. 
I blinked and he was everywhere I turned. I mean, he's like on the NBC Nightly News. You know, he's on, on network TV talking about uh, about AI. And I think it just caught fire because uh, people love to talk about the danger of AI. I mean, that's just that's just chum in the water for for, uh, you know, newscasters who like to get a spun up. So I think his message is certainly getting out there. That's for sure. But it was it was shocking what detail level nerdiness suddenly made national news or international news. It's funny, if you can tie it to a hot enough story, you can get the most amazing computer scientist onto the most mainstream of news stories. I wonder if we could do that for less <laughs> less terrifying things. And right. Nope, nope, nope. That's, no, that's we got to be works. terrified. Yeah, okay. that, that's what, uh, we want to watch a train wreck. No, no, there is another one we can be angry either, but that's not really any oh, better. Oh, goody. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> In fact, I'd rather be terrified than angry. No, I'd just rather not make that choice. Yeah, yeah never mind. Um, Occasionally, if you do it well enough, it can be a pull at the heartstrings can do it, you know? A story that's just so adorable you can't stand it, you know. That's why there's all those videos of Kittens. of like a, a cat raising raising a duck, a yes, duckling or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was a gay set of penguins somewhere that made it for a while as well, wasn't there? That was a thing for a while. I don't know, they but had, they uh, had yeah, funny names that kind of thing. Stuff. People anyway. just love. Um, <laughs> staying in the United States, uh, the Federal Trade Commission has started the process of updating their settlement with Facebook slash Meta. So they made it with Facebook, but now it's with Meta. So in 2020, uh, they came to a settlement in their suit against... About what? Uh, privacy invasion. In Was this the... the um Oh shoot! I can't remember uh, which which one. The twenty twenty one. Um, yeah, I just don't know what I don't know what the case was. was they they said that back. Facebook were not following the rules in terms of pri- of people's privacy, and they came to settle. So this that wasn't Cambridge Analytica. Don't believe it was so. Don't believe something this. after that. Twenty twenty okay. is too recent to be Cambridge, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, anyway, so they they started the process to do what then? to update the settlement to block Facebook from launching any new products until they come into compliance with the settlement, because right now they are not in compliance. <gasps> Whoa. Wait, no new projects or no products? New, no new products. No releasing, no data-based projects, products. Wow, yeah. that's great. That's, that's pretty big. That is pretty big. Now, Facebook have, uh, sorry, Meta have 30 days to formally respond, but their initial PO response has been, how dare you regulate an American company? Look at TikTok over there. And everyone's going, yeah, have you seen what the American government are threatening to do to TikTok? Are you sure that's a good idea? <laughs> Sorry, I've made you well, sp- nearly spit your coffee on your screen there. <laughs> yep, I was drinking when he said that. <laughs> so anyway, 30 days, we shall see how that develops. And then switching to the good news column, um, Google and Apple have worked together again. They did this at the start of COVID when they brought out the COVID trackers that never quite lived up to their promise because I think the, the virus moved too quickly for the idea, but they nonetheless... Sh- oh, can I give you a, a quick update on that? I got a notification from the state of California saying, yeah, that's over now. Yeah, the, me too. We've, we've disabled it. We're no longer tracking your phone. Yeah. Yeah, but they, I think they did it concurrent with the uh, WHO saying that the uh, international health crisis was over. COVID's not over. Yes. But the international health crisis is over. Yes, I love that announcement because it also said, by the way, just in case you're wondering, it's going to be with us here until the next one. So just, you know, settle in. It is endemic, pandemic, but not an emergency. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. Anyway, so now what have uh, Google and Apple done together? So I have said every time we've talked about the topic of how do we deal with these new AirTag-like trackers, and it's not just AirTag, you've Tile and you've uh, you've other companies doing them too. And uh, Apple products are really good at telling you when an Apple tracker is following you because Apple can talk... On an Apple device. Yeah, exactly. Apple products are very good at telling you when an Apple tracker is near you. Your iPhone, etc. Mm-hmm. is good at that. But in order for that to work universally, you need to have a protocol that is not vendor specific. And I have been, I had sort of expected Apple to open source what they're doing. But that would then involve people who make other trackers sort of agreeing to do things that way. But actually what Apple have done is they've worked with Google to develop a formal standard and they have now submitted it to the Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF. So it is now with the IETF for public comment, and if everything goes on schedule, it should become a formal standard by the end of the year. 
and all the big players are on board. Cool. I'm sorry, did you say what IETF stood for? Internet Engineering Task Force. I'm pretty sure okay. I did. But either way, the IETF yeah, are the did. people, they're the people who do things like HTTP and, you know, TCPIP. Oh, wow. the, the kind of, you know, slightly important technologies. That, yeah, that is a proper standard. I like budget. that because obviously both companies want that to exist. I mean, why would you not? Yeah, exactly. And humanity wants it to exist. So it's just, I just like, good. this is how it should be. You know, you, you compete on what makes you different and you work together on what makes, what doesn't make you different and makes everything better. It's grown up. Right. Grown up behavior. <laughs> I like it. And then finally, Google have rolled out support for passkeys across their large array of services. So that brings us a dramatic step closer to passkeys going from hypothetical to practical. That's a lot of humans on planet Earth have a Google account. Yeah. So like everybody else, I was super excited about this and I discovered something surprising and it, it leads me to a change I need to make and it also opens up another question for mm. me. So I was hoping I could just spring this on you uh, without any warning or a chance to do any research. <laughs> um, when I went to uh, Google, it said, yeah, do you want to use passkeys? I said, yes, I would. And it said, uh, it said, okay, here's a QR code, scan this with your phone. Now, right away, that concerned me because I don't understand why I had to have a second device in order to do it. Uh, maybe something to do with why? their implementation. That may be because, you're, because you were not in a position to actually use passkeys because of something you haven't turned on yet that we're getting to. I don't think the APIs were working right because it's supposed to be okay. that the browser should immediately go, ah, I see this site is offering you a passkey. Yeah, so it said I had to scan this uh, this QR code. So I took out my phone and I held it up, and it said, "Click, you know, tap this to get to your passkey." And I tapped it, and things spun for a little bit, and then it said, "No, I can't find anything in iCloud Keychain for this, and I don't use iCloud Keychain because I use one password." Oh, I, I don't want to use iCloud Keychain. That actually sounds like you tried to log in with. Because that's the workflow for logging in with a passkey rather than the workflow for creating a passkey. Th that's correct. I'm saying after, after I said turn on passkeys, it said, okay, got it. Now use your phone. And I can't, the, I have to bypass the, um, uh, I have to bypass the uh, QR code and tell it, no, get in another way now. So that's not working as designed. It's definitely not working as designed. But, uh, I don't know what the steps you did to get into this position, but you do not have a working passkey set up. And I definitely don't. So it's I'm reading it right now. It says, Google, use your passkey to confirm it's really you. And it gives my uh, Gmail address. It says, your device will ask for your fingerprint, face, or screen lock. And when I tap continue, it does not ask me for my fingerprint, face, or, or uh, anything else. It says, scan this QR code with a device running iOS 16 or later, or another compatible device to sign into Google.com. So, I, did I iOS, have a passkey. Did iOS offer you? No, you have half a passkey. I'm on my Mac. You're I'm on, on my Mac. You're on your Mac, and where and you don't have iCloud Keychain enabled. And where did you create this passkey? On my Mac. But it's asking me to scan the QR code, and the I, only thing I know to scan the QR code with would be my phone. I don't think you've created a passkey. I think you've told Google you'd like one, but I don't think you have one. Okay, uh, it thinks I do. It's saying that I do. It says you've enabled passkeys. Okay, without a time machine, I can't help you here. But it's so not I also right. don't know how to make it go away. You I should be I, able to log in to Google and remove it. So you know the way in Google, there's maybe. a page that lets you set all of your different authentication mechanisms. So whether you have a phone registered, your secondary email, like Google lets you have many, many doors to the same account. So in there, mm -hmm. one of your doors will be your passkey. So if you, if you had... You should uh, be able to turn it off. If you had a hardware mm -hmm. token, it would be in there. So your passkey will be in there and you should just remove it from your account. Like you would a phone or whatever. So if, if I did, I've just sent you the screenshot of what I see just so we can uh, be on the same page. I sent it in Telegram. But uh, if, if this was working... I shouldn't need my phone to log in with my Mac. But if I wanted to log in with my phone, I would probably have to have iCloud Keychain turned on. Okay, if... <sighs> mm. 
Okay, let's just, let's keep things simple. So let's start off with you have a Mac and you have a Google account and everything is set up correctly. You go there with your Mac and you turn on pass keys and then you will never see that screen because your Mac will be talking the pass key APIs and Google will be talking the pass key APIs and it will all just magically mm. happen. You then go to you you then go to a phone that also has iCloud Keychain and then it will also be completely seamless. But then you go to an internet cafe. And obviously, it's not your computer. So even with Mm -hmm. everything working perfectly, you wouldn't be able to authenticate on that device because it's not your device. So the mechanism Passkeys provides is that your phone can do the authentication for you. And in order to do that handoff between the device you're on and the device that's going to authenticate you, you have to scan a QR code. Yeah, so that makes sense, but the, but that phone would have to be have the pass keys as Correct. well, which which I believe requires iCloud Keychain. Now, what surprised me about that was I thought we were going to be able to do that with one password, but one password hasn't done it yet. I think I think you're they've, too early. They've got it where you can create an account with a pass key, but you can't store your pass keys in one password yet. If yes, I understand you can use where a pass we are in key time to authenticate yourself to your vault on your phone which is a good way to authenticate yourself on your phone. It's a good, strong authentication on mm-hmm. your phone. But it, they don't have it to the point where they are managing pass keys for other websites, which is, that is coming, right? Yeah, they are so going there. We're early, yeah. 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 So um, talking about the reason I haven't ever done iCloud Keychain, uh, actually, no, let me wait one more t- minute on the mm-hmm. on the Gmail thing. And thinking about this in a in a holistic form, if I've got authentication to a site such as Google with um, pass keys, can that be shared with Steve Sheridan? So Steve uses this account to do some of the live show stuff because this is the account that runs the, the YouTube videos. So the answer is yes, and you can do it the right way or the wrong way. So okay. with modern authentication, you need to get out. So the way we're used to thinking about things is that an account has a password. That's not the way you should think about things in the 21st century. So the correct thing is that you add to the one Google account two pass keys, your pass key and Steve's pass key. You don't share the pass key, that's your pass key. But you want him so to share he, the account. And the way he would do that is on his Mac log in with the password yep. into my Google account and then say, turn on pass keys. Yes. So then when you go to okay. that screen okay. where you get to have your phone and your alternate email address, you would see two pass keys. Mm-hmm. And you could then okay. revoke one of them if one of you lost your phone or whatever. Okay. Okay, good. That was that was one of my concerns. Once I got this, I was like, well, wait a minute, how is that ever going to work? Um so now stepping back uh, further to the, uh, if I can't use one password yet, mm. and I'm now, I really want to try this out. So I'm going to turn on iCloud Keychain. The one of the things that's really kept me from doing it is I didn't want to manage passwords in two places. So if I go to uh, mybank.com and I change my password, one password goes, hey, do you want me to update that login? And I say, yes. Do I now have to go over to iCloud Keychain and manage it there? Only if you want, want to store it in two I places. Don't, don't, don't store it in your iCloud keychain. Let it, the pass keys can be in your keychain, but if you never put a password into your key, if you never put a password into iCloud, it won't be in iCloud. Oh, so you you may, see, I literally have never used this intentionally. I, th- I think I accidentally did some early on, but then I was like, oh, and I got rid of everything. I think. Um, so you have to you have to agree to let something be in iCloud keychain. So I was afraid that as soon as I turned on, it was going to go bleh, and then barf everything into, into iCloud Keychain where I didn't want it to no, be. No, it's it, it's like the standard Safari thing, because it is the standard Safari thing. It'll pop up and say, hi, do you want me to save this password? And if you just say, no, I don't actually, then it won't. Okay. I think I've successfully beaten Safari into submission to stop asking me. But somehow I have to tell it that it's okay to store that pass key. Well, I guess I'll find out when I turn it on. I haven't used pass keys myself. I've seen screens. I've seen videos of it in action, but it should be mm-hmm. the it should be the operating system offering you to do its thing, and it should be very automatic. Okay. All right. Well, I will. Uh, I will certainly give that a try, and I will report back. But uh, yeah, it really does feel like I something broke on the uh, the day I got in. 
Yeah. I, I don't remember being asked any questions whatsoever about how it was going to work. I remember going, do you want pass keys? Oh, uh-huh. click. And then I got in that state. The very first thing it did was ask me to scan that barcode. Yeah. I could be misremembering. That has happened maybe once in, in the past. It's definitely not right. Not entirely sure how it okay. got wrong, but it's definitely not right. Um, okay, good. I do see one pass key there. Oh, good Lord. It says I did it on my Motorola Moto G7. Okay, this is confusing. I will do this on another time. <laughs> okay. That's but I appreciate you answering the questions. And I think that's a value to people to, to think about the repercussions and how this works. And also just sort of what occurred to me when you asked me the question, even though you didn't give me a lot of prep time, you did, I did have some time to noodle. You, you were very much against turning on iCloud quite a few years ago because back then the reality was very different, right? If you had iCloud Keychain turned on, and you had passwords in it, and I picked up your phone. You had left your phone down, and you hadn't locked it because you put it down for a second. Then I picked up your phone. I could log into things because right. it just took the passwords. But today, even if you had passwords in there, and you put your phone down without locking it, and I picked your phone up, and I tried to log in as you to something, it would do the Face ID thing, and it would stop me. And I couldn't go oh. into the Keychain app because it would do the face eye thing and it would stop me. So the level of access that was implicit, the level of trust that was implicit when you decided against it has changed completely. So you made a very sensible choice when the universe was different. And so my <laughs> advice is, to, you know, don't worry too much about turning it back, turning it on now, because you were not wrong to turn it off then. But it's then is not now. So don't think that, I'm not sure I'm saying what I'm trying to say very well, but the decision you no, made then th- was I perfectly we- sane, perfectly reasonable. And doing the opposite now is not choosing insecurity. It's everything's changed. Okay. I do still hate the idea of having to manage passwords in two places. Though. Don't manage them in two I don't places, understand so how people, but I, but I know people who do. I know Dave Hamilton talks about how he does both. I do both. I do too. So you change it in one place, you have to change it in another, but you change it in two uh, separate systems. The browser systems. does it all for me. Because it'll, it'll say, do you want me to update in iCloud? Yeah. And it'll say, yeah. and the plugin will do go, yeah. update in the other. Yeah, I just go, yeah. And it just, it's Okay, a, well, it's if it does less, that, not too bad. Yeah, it's a less frictiony, but there's no, I only do it because I like the safety of having them in two places. It's just, I sort of think of it as, hmm. you know, I have one secure place and I have another secure place and then there are two places and I feel better. But <laughs> I don't think you need to do that. I, I don't advise people to do that. I do it because it just makes me feel better. I'm not even sure it's wise. I just, I just feel better. <laughs> Okay, well, that sounds good. Uh, I definitely understand a lot more, and I might turn it on. If nothing else, I will try to turn off uh, the the uh, um, passkeys right now for Google, just so that I can get in without having to go through yeah, a second step. Yeah, just remove that authentication mechanism, and you should be good to go. Yeah, I haven't found it yet in my poking around while we're talking, but I did find a place where one of your options is uh, that is turned on by default is... Um, to not show you the password option. So you have a toggle and that's turned on uh-huh. that's saying, don't show me the password option because, well, because you got a passkey. Why do you want to bother looking at that? I think was the idea, except that it's not working. So it always forces me to go an extra step. Ah, yes, of I'm course. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm not certain I know how to get rid of this passkey. I can see it, that it's there. Don't know how to get rid of it, but I'll find out. Um, moving All us- right. On then, uh, oh, there we go. We have a top tip. So we've talked a few times about the importance of having your own email domain because otherwise it's really easy to get locked out of your everything. And if you're not going to have your Mm -hmm. own one, probably the worst possible thing you could do would be to use one provided by your ISP. So if you'd like to hear someone else explain exactly the same thing with different words, Apple Insider have a lovely article, Why ISP Email Services Are Terrible. And what you what to use instead. So it's it's not one for you or I, but it's one to keep in your bank pocket for your family members who send you, oh yeah, no, I have everything connected to my Cox dot whatever Comcast. Yeah. 
You know, I was really uh, pleased. I, it's Steve's mom and dad are just so smart They because they listen to us and they do what we we suggest <laughs> after we explain it to them. I, I wasn't going to say they do what we tell them to do. We suggest things and they, they jump on board as they had their email with Comcast. And I explained that, you know, that's not portable. If you move, you know, that's not going to work. And they said, okay, what do we do? So, okay, well, let's start by forwarding your email to Gmail. And when you write to people, write to from your Gmail account. And I got them going on that. And then over time, got them to just shut down and go into their services and make sure they turned all, you know, switched yeah. it all over. And that took them months and months and months it to get fine. done. But they went through the work. And about six months later, they decided to move. They My didn't goodness. have to add that to the worry of, you know, finding a place to live, packing, all the horrors of moving. Uh, yeah. And, uh they were they were fully able to move without losing any contact. Actually, Steve's mom said, "Yeah, anybody I didn't tell, I actually don't care if they ever write to me again." <laughs> it's been six months. If I haven't heard from you, I don't need to hear from you. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I told you, I like to have these links in my back pocket. I have a little folder in pocket called for reference, and that one went in, and I thought it would be worth sharing with people. Um, yeah, good one. Another interesting follow-up. So the internet collectively went mad on telling people about juice checking, and I was pretty cold about it. I just sort of pointed out that there's been no change, there's no added risk, and that just because it was making the media, I, I didn't... This, so again, juice checking is is plugging in at the airport to charge, but somebody's actually stealing your data. Yeah. You did say it was a danger, though. It it's just a wasn't a new danger. It's just the FBI... But at the time, we didn't really talk about it as being merely hypothetical. We talked about it that you really shouldn't do it. Yeah, I didn't throw enough cold water on it. It's it's garbage. It, it doesn't actually happen on planet Earth. Yeah, which I did not know until uh, Ars Technica talked about it, that they said, yeah, this doesn't actually happen. Yeah. Has now, not happened. There are no reports of it in the wild. It's... The other thing that has changed in the last couple of years is kind of like the iCloud conversation. The reality of the phones have changed. So it used to be the case that if I took your, say, your generation one iPhone and if I plugged it into my computer, I could just get your stuff. Like I could just right, download right. your stuff. So if I replace that computer with some sort of dongle, I could just have it automatically steal your stuff. And people successfully hid that kind of functionality in a cable. Right? They were mm -hmm. like hacking cables. but. Apple responded to that, and so did Google uh, with Android. So when you plug your phone into a device that it has not been cryptographically paired with, it won't talk to it. It, will, it just won't talk to it. So the danger is really, really hypothetical. You would have to have a zero day to work around the, the blocking that's happening. And then if, if you're afraid of even the zero day that no one knows about, which has never been found to exist, you can buy a thing <laughs> called a data blocker, which is like a USB sleeve that goes over your USB port that physically doesn't connect the data cables. So the mm -hmm. only pins connected in this little shoe are the power ones. So if you buy one of those little overshoes and the coolest ones are actually transparent, so you can see the gap, you can look through the casing and see that the cables are not connected. <laughs> And then you're absolutely completely fine because data can't magically. So you're protected by hardware. And even if you weren't, there is a strong firmware level protection. And even if that wasn't there, the actual device itself, like it's. There you are can many make your layers. own data only cable by, by splicing, cutting a, a USB cable and peeling back the, uh, the shielding and then uh, don't connect the data, the data yeah. connectors, the data cables, and just connect the power and then wrap it back in electrical tape, which, by the way, is how I met Tom Merritt. I probably told the story the last time we talked about this, but he's, he liked it so much he put it on his top five uh, many, 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 many years ago. And that's why we became friends. Uh, now, what I want is the opposite thing. I oh. would like a data-only cable. And I'll tell you the problem to be solved is um, what's the continuity thing that allows you to use an iPad as a second screen oh, to your Mac? Oh, Sidecar. Sidecar. So Sidecar is completely unreliable for me on Wi-Fi. I don't know why, but I like to sit outside on the... No, I know why I like to sit outside on the back deck. But if I'm sitting out in the sun, I'm relaxing, I want a second screen. If I try to use my iPad, it'll connect. It'll be all great. I'll be working along and all of a sudden, bing, it's just gone. It just gives up. Right. So I can connect it over USB-C, Thunderbolt, whatever you want to call it that, that day, and, uh, and it works great. But the iPad sucks the battery out of the laptop. Now, you may have heard me mention that my Indeed. battery doesn't last on my laptop. And so here's this giant battery in the iPad. So unless I've, I've charged the iPad to 100%, right. 
you know, and as it uses power, it starts sucking it out of the out of the Mac, and I don't want it to do that. So I want the opposite. So I might need to get out my scissors. Yeah, have a go. I don't know how much more because the opposite it is should be USB-C. possible. Yeah, but remember the amount of remember that USB C has circuitry a and all that. It has a it has a chip in each end of the cable, and they negotiate stuff. I yeah. don't know how they'd feel about suddenly having some of their connection interrupted. I don't. I'm not entirely sure you'll get away with that one. Yeah, I might have to look. I actually did try to look for data only USB C, and I don't think I have yet found that. You'd imagine there's a low level API call somewhere to tell to tell the little controller not to send power. I would imagine that the APIs allow it, and someone just has to write an app, like you know, Juice Blocker or something. Because I'm almost certain yeah, that well, software wise, that should be conceivably doable, but. Not with my. You would think so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I will. I will keep on the hunt. Indeed. Okay. Well, that uh, that is it. That is that is all the nope. stories we got. No. Nope. nope. I came up with a palate cleanser oh. while we were talking. Oh, good, actually, because I forgot. So one. this this is so delightful, and it just shows the the level of depth of nerdery that we have in the Nasilla Castaways that I just love. So uh, the best channel in the in Slack is Delete Me. By yeah. far. It's funny. It's clever. It's wonderful. Uh, Alistair Jenks basically owns the channel, and it's that's his, fine. We're yeah, all good with channel, it because yeah. it, every once in a while I get one that's almost as good as something he's posted. But Ian Lessing posted one that was just wonderful. He it, This was a screenshot he took on his computer years and years and years ago from an iPhoto library mar- migration. <laughs> the screenshot says, upgrading thumbnails, time remaining, about 214748- three six four seven hours now, i don't know how many digits that was but we all had a good laugh about it but that's not where it ended alistair because he is such a nerd writes back that number can also be written as two to the 31st minus one which means it is the largest positive number in a 32-bit integer in other uh-huh. words it was not expecting it to take nearly 245 millennia but in fact an infinite amount of time it just couldn't find the and he wrote words, but he crossed it out. It just couldn't find the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is one of those magic numbers. Yeah. No, I am but the full. fact that he saw it and went, oh, yeah, I, I recognize 214748364747 hours. That's obviously two to the 31st minus one. <laughs> I recognize some of those magic uh, numbers, but not as many as Alistair does. Um, I think his mainframe uh, experience great. helps him out. It does remind me of when uh, I knew a really nerdy guy from Caltech and he walked into my office one day and he said, do you realize that your office number is the product of the first five prime numbers? No. (laughs) What's wrong with you? (laughs) I'm the kind of person who finds myself buying things. And then when I get only when I get home, do I realize why it's because they're powers of two. It's like there were four different loaves of bread I could have bought. Why did I buy the one that cost 256? Oh, Really? Really? <laughs> like those are the pleasing numbers. They are, honestly, I find myself with stuff in my shopping basket that's slightly more expensive because it's 1.28 or 2.56. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> but yeah. And it's subconscious. And I only no, want to get funny. home. Do I notice? It's like, oh. Well, you know what's going to really bother you? I read that uh, Mark Gurman is predicting that the uh, the new M3 Max, which are supposed to be announced any day now for maybe end of the year, uh, will have 36 gigabytes of memory, not 32. Why? So how do you, how's the extra four? I'm guessing it's like graphics RAM or something. I, I, no, you're right. It does be slightly cranky. No, that no, that's going to be, two. that's going to be upsetting. Well, it does divide by two, but it's not a power of two. Yeah. Ah, no, don't like it. Don't like it. Mind you, more RAM, more good. All right. Well, I managed to stretch out the shortest show notes of all time to 47 minutes. So, And you're probably out of coffee by now, uh, so I will let you go. But that was a lot of fun. Yep, he's showing me his empty mug. I'm out of coffee, and um, I also have the opposite problem. I need to go visit a little room. So, um, wait, this is Security Bits. Therefore, I need to remind you, because it's been so long since we talked about security here, uh, remember, folks, to stay patched so you stay secure. Well, after 18 years, that's going to wind us up for this week. Did you know you can email me at allison at podfeed.com anytime you like? Lots of people write to me and I love engaging with people. You can tell. Remember the whole thing I said about Mastodon? I like people to talk to me. So send me an email anytime you like. 
If you have questions or a suggestion, just send it on over. You can follow me on Mastodon at podfeet at chaos.social. Of course, there's a link in the show notes. And remember, everything good starts with podfeet.com. If you want to join in the fun of the conversation, you can join our Slack community at podfeet.com slash Slack, where you can talk to me and all of the other lovely Nocilla castaways and enjoy Alistair Jenks' uh, Delete Me channel that we were just talking about. You can support the show at podfeet.com slash Patreon or with a one-time donation, podfeet.com slash PayPal. And if you want to join in the fun of the live show, head on over to podfeet.com slash live on Sunday nights at 5 p.m. Pacific time and join the friendly and enthusiastic Nocilla Castaways. Thanks for listening and stay subscribed.